From the CBS Broadcast Center in Midtown Manhattan, this is the Republican primary debate for governor of New York. Brought to you by CBS 2 News and News Radio 880. Tonight, Rob Astorino, Andrew Giuliani, Harry Wilson, and Congressman Lee Zeldin face off in their first full debate of the campaign with your moderator, Maurice Dubois, and political reporter, Marsha Kramer. Here is Maurice Dubois. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. So glad to have you with us tonight. We look forward to a vigorous debate this evening. We want to thank the candidates for being here. Rob Astorino, Harry Wilson, Representative Lee Zeldin, and Andrew Giuliani. At a note, because of the vaccination requirements in this building, Mr. Giuliani is participating in the debate remotely from a studio nearby. We also want to tell you we want to thank our partners, News Radio 880, for co sponsoring tonight's debate. Before we begin, a few rules to mention. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to our questions. There will be rebuttals when deemed necessary. And candidates, we are asking you to please respect the time limits. We will turn off the microphones if they are exceeded. With that, let's get right to the questions. And the first one is for Mr. Giuliani. The hearings are underway, as you know, sir, in Washington on the attack on the Capitol in January of 2021. What, if any, role do you think former President Trump played in the riot? And do you believe Donald Trump should run for president in 2024? Well, first and foremost, let me thank all the New Yorkers for tuning in tonight. And I also want to thank all the New Yorkers for all the support that I've heard over the last 48 hours. You know, I was very honored, Maurice, to work four years in President Trump's White House. I've known him for over 20 years. I consider him a good friend. Uh, and I would certainly support him if he decided to run for president. Uh, you know, the media has been fixated on January 6th for the better part of a year and a half now. And I would like to see a congressional hearing on the 274 riots that happened between May of 2020 and, June of Jan and January 5th of 2021, rather than just uh, a uh, one day where the media is completely focused on. Uh, I think President Trump was a great president, and honestly, I'm hopeful that he runs again. I would be honored uh, in any capacity, certainly as governor of New York, uh, to work with a president that was as effective as he was. And that's the kind of change that he brought to the United States of America that we need to bring to New York. Same question, Mr. Zeldin. Uh, president Trump told his supporters to go peacefully and patriotically to the Capitol. Uh, and if President Trump wants to run, he should run. And I believe that he'll be the Republican nominee and he'll win. Now, never Trump or Harry Wilson, who's here, refused to vote for Donald Trump in the 2020 election against Joe Biden. Look how we are now as a nation. I believe that we're battling for the heart and soul of our country. And it's not just the Democrats, but it's the rhinos like Harry Wilson who are out there making sure that we have this moment in time with one party Democratic rule in Washington, D.C. As far as what we're seeing with these hearings, uh, Nancy Pelosi wouldn't even allow Republicans to pick their members to be on this committee. And I believe that it's important for us to be focusing on the illegal immigrants coming across our southern border, the fentanyl that's coming across, the human trafficking, the labor trafficking, the drug trafficking, our nation's foreign policy, the supply chain crisis, inflation. It is important for us to be focusing on the issues that Mer Americans are saying are the most important issues to them. That's where Congress should be spending their time right now. Mr. Zeldin, thank you. Mr. Wilson, one more time. What, if any, role do you think former President Trump played in the riot and do believe he should run for president in 2024? So, Mr. DeWa, I'm going to take, uh, answer your question. I'm also going to respond to Mr. Zeldin's dishonest attacks. So, first, I believe people have responsibility for their own actions. That people who broke the law should be prosecuted to the fullest extent in any illegal activity. And they have responsibility for the Does that apply to Mr. Else. Trump? No, the people who broke the law by invading the Capitol. Mr. Trump did not invade the Capitol. So the people who broke the law by invading the Capitol should be prosecuted. And that's where the responsibility lies. The people actually broke the law. If Mr. Trump chooses to run for president in 2024, I do believe he'll be the nominee. And he'll make that decision in due time. Now, Mr. Zeldin is going to go on to a series of attacks. You saw him even before I had a chance to speak, just like he started attacking me before I ran my campaign. It's because he's scared, because he's a broken candidate. Now, let's look at the facts. I am a Reagan conservative. I have been one since I was a little kid. My dog is named Dutch Reagan. My daughter's middle name is Reagan. Okay? I have fought for conservative principles my whole life, from a college Republican to running for state controller when I was a 2010 nominee, and I won more votes and got closest to winning statewide than any Republican in the last 20 years, running on the most fiscally conservative platform in, the la in my lifetime. 
That is not what Mr. Zeldin is trying to do. Why is he doing this? Because he will do anything and say anything to distract from his terrible record as a Cuomo clone, which defines his time in Albany. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Astorino, what, if any, role do you think former President Trump played in the riot? Do you believe he should run for president in 2024? Well, look, January 6th was a horrible day in our nation's history. It was horrible to watch, and it's a stain on our country. I do think he bears some responsibility. I think most people would say that Look, we've got to move on, though. I mean, these hearings right now are complete and utter political theater in Washington, D.C. And what I think should happen is we need to start looking towards 2022 this year. That's why I'm running for governor. Our state is in a crisis right now. Our country is an utter mess with President Biden. And what happens in 2024, the party will figure that out, whether President Trump wants to run or not. But we've got great candidates if he doesn't run in Ron DeSantis. And I can go down through the whole list. So for me, I'm running for governor because this state is a mess. And yes, Lee Zeldin had his time in Albany when he was in the Senate majority under Dean Skelos. And yes, he sided with Andrew Cuomo. He was a reliable vote for Andrew Cuomo the entire time. So he, hit, he did have his chance and he blew it. And that's another reason why I'm running because I ran in 14 and everything has just gotten worse. Thank you. Mr. Astorino, the Supreme Court is Mind poised. If I can I rebut? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you, Marsha. Uh, notice that uh, never Trump or Harry Wilson didn't deny the fact that he refused to vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. Now, as far as what we're seeing with these constant lies from uh, Never Trumper Wilson and Rolex Rob, is that they claim that I had supported Andrew Cuomo. I actually endorsed the Republican against Andrew Cuomo every time in 2010, 2014, 2018, and led the call for his prosecution. But what's really ironic is that Rolex Rob, I actually supported him. I brought him into my area. I helped introduce him to voters. But he wants to be governor. That Listen, he's on a losing streak. He has now lost three consecutive races for three different offices. He'll say anything he possibly can for votes. The Cuomo attack is ridiculous, and I supported him against Cuomo in 2014. Okay, we're going to move on. Mr. Astorino, you get the next question. <laughs> okay, good. The Supreme Court is poised to overturn New York's gun permit law, but there are some who are hoping that the court will allow the state to consider banning guns from so-called sensitive areas, even Times Square supermarkets, churches, things like that. If you're elected governor, would you introduce and support a sensitive areas bill? And if you did, what places do you think you should be able, people should be able to post a no handguns allowed sign. Well, we have gun free zones right now. They don't work at all because we're looking at something, and I think we need to change the, the debate a little bit here <clears throat> from gun control to criminal control. Right now, it's the criminals who get away with everything, okay? And it's the law abiding New Yorkers who have a Second Amendment right to own a weapon for self defense who are being targeted all the time. We have a district attorney right now in Manhattan. Alvin Bragg, who should be fired. I mean, he is refusing to prosecute crimes. And the biggest problem is they drop criminal charges when somebody is arrested with an illegal possession of a weapon. That should never be. We should actually add charges and penalties to gun crimes. You know, we've got a parole board right now that has released 20 cop killers in the last two years under Hochul. They should all be fired. We got to get back to actually what worked broken windows policy, stop, question, and frisk. The majority of these gun, cr gun crimes are in a small area, concentrated area in our urban areas. That's where we got to target to get illegal guns Mr. off the streets. Mr. Astorino, your time is up. Mr. Wilson, same well, question. Sure, I agree with that. I think the problem is we have a broken debate on this issue. I've been a staunch defender of the Second Amendment my whole life. I started shooting when I was eight years old. I'm a gun owner today. I have never had a problem, and nor will I ever have a problem. The problem is with people, not with law-abiding citizens, but with criminals, the mentally ill, and the purveyors of hate. And those are the people we should be cracking down and focusing on. And instead of doing the hard work of that, the Democrats at Albany are blaming and attacking the rights of law-abiding citizens. So in my 14-page crime plan, we are focused on taking away illegal guns and dealing with problems of criminals. We need to focus on the mentally ill. And for example, on the purveyors of hate, the governor had a task force that was formed two years ago. She did not even make her appointments made to the task force until after the tragedy in Buffalo. And so that is the problem, is ineffective government not dealing with the core problem rather than blaming the citizens who are law-abiding. Mr. Zeldin. 
Gun-free zones don't work. It actually becomes a target for innocent civilians to be attacked because the person who is carrying out the offense knows that they're going to encounter less resistance. We should repeal the unconstitutional SAFE Act. We should change the law in New York from May issue to shall issue. The, New York, the United States Supreme Court should overturn New York State's concealed carry law. We have the strictest gun control laws in the entire country. They've gone too far as it is. They target law-abiding citizens. Uh, I believe that it is, uh, and, and I'm somebody who is an A-rated, lifetime NRA member. I'm the endorsed NRA candidate in this race. I'm endorsed by the president of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. I'm endorsed by the chairman of the board of SCOPE. We need to be protecting and defending the rights of law-abiding gun owners. We should repeal cashless bail. Uh, we should fire DAs like Alvin Bragg, who refused to enforce the law. Never Trump or Harry Wilson donated to the campaign of liberal Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Excuse we should overhaul the parole up. board. Your time is up. Mr. Giuliani, same was, question. Uh, I'm sorry? Sounds like I'm missing some fireworks over there, but uh, I have to tell you, you know, when I think about mm -hmm. the Second Amendment and I think about this debate mm -hmm. and I think about what Governor Hochul has done, she has continued to mm -hmm. encroach on New Yorkers' Second Amendment rights rather than empowering the police. Look, Marsha, we need to end this war on our police. I heard one of the other candidates invoke broken windows, invoke stop, question, and frisk. We need to utilize programs that take New York City specifically and that we can do for the state from 2,000 murders a year in the early 90s to less than 600 murders a year just five short years later, so, so Mr. and then Giuliani, less than 300 you, murders a year. Are you saying we should go back to the programs that your father instituted, broken windows, and stop, question, and frisk? Yes, I am, Marsha, clearly. And I look at it this way. When you look at when stop, question, and frisk in the late 90s, when we were between 70 and 100,000 stops a year, every single year the Justice Department ruled it constitutional. You know who did that as Deputy Attorney General? Eric Holder, believe it or not. It's when the quota system came in in the 2010s when we were stopping 700,000 people a year. Your time when is up, it Mr. might have gotten out of control. So, to be, we absolutely need to end this war on cops and allow proactive policing Thank again. You. Mr. Astorino wants to rebut. Well, I'm a concealed carry permit holder. And if I walked into the Bronx from Yonkers, let's say, I could be a felon overnight. And where I would need it the most because of this defund and defame the police movement, I would become a felon because. You're not allowed it in New York City, which is utterly insane. You know, Lee talks about the SAFE Act. You're right. But the problem is you have funded it every single year when you were in Albany. Cuomo said, do this. You said, okay, no problem. And all the junk in the Cuomo budgets, including the SAFE Act, you funded. So when you talk about the unsafe act, you're correct. But you were part of the problem because you were part of the status quo in Albany. And Marsh, I got the first rebuttal because Mr. Zeldin's attacked me twice in the last appearance. So let's be clear. What, what's happened, let's look at the facts. In 2010, Mr. Zeldin and I campaigned together. In the years since, he has asked me multiple times to run for statewide office. In January of this year, he asked me to be on his ticket. Now, why is he dishonestly attacking me now? Because his campaign is disintegrating. He is spending illegally because he has spent all of his primary cash. And he knows he is flailing. So he's attacking the biggest threat because we're surging right now. The reason we're surging is when people know about our turnaround plan to fix New York State, it's not some career politician who failed us in Albany for four years, but someone's going to come in after 30 years of fixing broken companies, turn Albany upside down, and make it work for the voters and taxpayers of the state, just like I have done in company after company. That's the skill set we need in Albany, not another failed Albany politician. Mr. Yeah, I mean, I, I never asked, and I wouldn't ask, yes, never Trump did. or Harry Wilson. January 12th, you did. Governor. I've got the notes from that conversation. Don't lie. I, there's, Don't lie. Okay, that is a zero percent chance but as far as 100 percent chance you did i wouldn't it. want you to serve as you asked governor. i asked Al you asked, you know, asked. commanding stop officer lying. and deputy inspector of the 70th you precinct asked. stop lying she was 24 years along a career in the nypd she would have become an nypd chief her father was an nypd chief she was I the 15th honored. person you asked and you know it i, I mean this guy Everybody doesn't stop you you're wrong on the wrong debate stage man you should be debating hochel and williams i and will Swansea. in the general election you should be on the democratic party primary debate stage yep. right now. now as far as what astorino fun. stated uh, he knows this there's nothing in that budget that funded the safe act yes, i opposed oh, the on. safe act That's every step of the way i co-sponsored the bill to repeal it 
I spoke at Pro 2A rallies against the SAFE Act. After Listen, I don't mind taking on all three of you here tonight, and I'm looking forward to taking on and defeating Kathy Hochul in November. But you can lie as much as you want, but Republican voters are smarter than you, Harry Wilson. You went to Harvard, yes, but don't think that you are smarter than the Republican voters across the state of New York who can sort they figure you out, never Trumper. They figured you out that you worked twice they, for they as an Obama advisor. Right now that you're they a figured child. you out You're that you fired right your now. unvaccinated right. employees. Guys, we're more you talk, the more it helps everybody else. We need to be honest with voters. Keep talking. We need to be honest with voters. The more it helps Wilson, everybody else. Mr. Wilson, has gun violence or crime ever personally impacted your life? And if so, how? And has it changed you? Yeah. Uh, you know, and this is uh, really recent. On Thursday night, my cousin's father was murdered in his backyard. And it was by a, a monster who was out on cashless bail upstate who had committed two assaults in recent weeks and set a fire in his backyard to draw him out and then stabbed him to death. This on Thursday night. So when my cousin called me, she, pro she said, you have to get elected. You have to fix this problem. And I'm going to do everything in my power to do it. That's, so that's, and that's, that's the biggest problem in the policy debate is people in elected office do not spend enough time thinking about victims. They think about the criminals. They do not spend enough time thinking about victims. People like my cousin's father, who was 77 years old and a good man and been married to 50 years, his wife was inside when he was killed. That should not happen in the state of New York in 2022. Well, we're sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, Mr. Giuliani, has gun violence ever personally impacted your life or crime? In, in well, what ways? Yeah, well, I grew up with cops, honestly, and, and uh, my confirmation sponsor uh, is a retired first grade detective. So I've heard the stories of going out on the beat day in and day out. Not sure if you're going to get home to your family. Uh, I had a very good friend of mine who's been on the job now for 16 years uh, who was shot. Um, and every time that I think about this defund the police debate that we've been hearing, every time that I think about the fact that we have cashless bail in New York where the, the numbers are just absolutely going the opposite direction. Look, we lead the country in out migration here, Maurice, and it's for a magnitude of reasons. But when I look at crime specifically, I see the number one reason right here. Like I said before, this is not just a New York City problem. This is also up in Rochester where they had the most murders ever in recorded history. Same thing in Binghamton last year where they had the most murders ever in recorded history. Buffalo is, one, is in the top 10% of mid-level level cities for violent crime. This is all across the state. And on day mm -hmm. one, I will sit down with the leader of the assembly and the state senate and tell them I need a full repeal of bail reform on my desk or I am not passing anything in your upcoming budget. Thank Period. you, Mr. Giuliani. Mr. Mr. Astorino, was gun violence or crime ever personally impacted you or your life? Actually, I was working at Pizza Hut way back when and somebody came in with a gun and robbed us. So I've had to deal with that personally. But professionally, you know, unfortunately, as Westchester County Executive, I had to attend the funerals of police officers who were killed including here in New York City. And right now, everything is chaos. It's chaos in New York City. It is chaos, as Andrew said, because I've been to all these cities as well, and people just don't feel safe. But in New York City, you, you try to go into the city to have a good time with your family, and everyone's looking over your shoulder. You know, if you're lucky, you'll be hit over the head with a bag of poop. I mean, that's a good day going into the city now, and you might get hit with a hammer or shoved onto the train tracks. People are really concerned about what's happening, and there is a complete utter breakdown. Mm -hmm. We have to get back to what made New York City and all our cities the safest in America. That is getting back to what actually worked, helping our police departments, giving support to law enforcement, and stop coddling criminals. Criminals deserve to be in jail. Thank you. Mr. Zeldin, same question. This has been the hardest part of serving an elected office is going to a funeral, going to a wake of someone who is dying too young in life, uh, especially these NYPD uh, funerals that we've gone to recently. And you, you hear the family members speaking out, calling out elected officials and asking for action. And calling out Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg personally by name, you could tell how personal it is for these families. Has crime ever impacted you personally or your family? Sure. Well, for I haven't had anyone in the family targeted by gun violence, but I have gone to funerals, and uh, it's it's personally impacted. I would say it's the hardest part of serving in Congress. And while we have that conversation here tonight about guns, 
We can't also lose sight of that other conversation about all the crimes not involving guns. I mean, you heard Rob talking about people pushed in front of an oncoming subway car, uh, stabbed to death in their apartment in lower Manhattan, beaten to death with a hammer, the anti-Semitic violence, the Asian-American community that's being targeted, Sikh cab drivers who are being targeted. We have to combat all of this raw, violent hate. Thank you. So the next question goes to you, Mr. Giuliani. Um, everyday New Yorkers are feeling the pinch of the economy, rising prices for food, gas, just about everything. Um, and they're affecting the family pocketbook. What can you do as governor? What can you do as governor yeah. to bring some relief? Well, how amazing a difference it's been over the last two years, Marsha, when we were looking at $2 a gallon gas. And now New Yorkers this winter may have to make the tough decision between filling up their fridge and heating their home. And uh, it, it really is terribly sad. I think first and foremost, what from can an you energy do? standpoint, what, can you what do? we can do, I'm, I'm answering the question here, Marsha. Um, I think what I can do first and foremost is we can tap into the Marce Marcellus Shale and specifically the energy and make New York truly the best fracking state in the country. We have that ability to do that here in the state of New York. We need to make sure that we're doing everything, not just to say that we're going to reignite New York, but really do it. And that starts with energy here. It also starts with maybe competing more with the likes of Florida, of Texas, and Tennessee from a regulatory standpoint, as well as from a tax standpoint. You know, when I think about New York, we're competing with California to be the highest tax state in the country. That's going to continue to push job creators and Mr. businesses Giuliani, down to Florida. Mr. Zeldin, same we, question. We have to reverse the ban on the safe extraction of natural gas in the Marcellus and Utica shales. The southern tier is desperate for it. There are other counties that want it. It would allow us to create jobs and generate revenue and revitalize communities uh, and to be able to drive down energy costs. There's also pipeline applications right now up in Albany collecting dust, being delayed, denied. Instead, they should be getting approved. If we move forward with this, and we have to cut spending in this state, there's so much wasteful spending, tens of billions of dollars worth it. I have a plan that would provide the largest tax cut in the history of the state of New York. For Broome County alone, I heard that the estimate was $2 billion in economic development for a county desperate for it. Meanwhile, for the next act of one-party Democratic rule in Albany, they want, the, they want to have a statewide ban on, this, on the hookup of new construction for gas. Uh, that's wrong. We saw it in New York City. It's wrong if they want to do it statewide. Uh, I feel like we have a great opportunity here, but we have to reverse that ban on the safe extraction of natural gas. Mr. Astorino, next up. Yeah, Same so look, question. Definitely, New York is blessed with natural gas. We should be safely drilling it and making sure that it's provided for everyone who needs it in New York and in our country. Nuclear option, that's two. Indian Point was closed in Westchester, and that was 25% of our energy. I think we can build nuclear power plants throughout New York State. They're very safe, and they're good for the environment. But we uh, have, should have an all-of-the-above approach with energy. You know, look, as Westchester County Executive, I had to work every day to help tr create jobs, and 44,000 were created in Westchester when I was there. I went right to work on the budget. We had a big deficit. We cleaned that up. $1.8 billion was the budget when I walked in the door, and it was 1.8 when I left. That is fiscal conservatism. That allowed us to actually cut property taxes and never raise them. Imagine if they had done that in New York State. We'd be much better, but no. They, the Republicans in the Senate majority at the time under Dean Skelos and, and Lee Zeldin, just went with the Cuomo budgets. And so the train kept going on the track. So today, the budget went from $178 billion to $220 billion, and everyone is leaving New York because nobody can afford it. So here's what I'm going to tell you, folks. Help is on the way. I've had to do this in the past, and I will do it again. We will make sure that New York is more affordable for everybody because nobody, nobody can afford it anymore. The middle class, the working class, they are getting clobbered every single day. Mr. Wilson. So, Marsha, this is a huge issue, and that's why it's one of the three key pillars of my turnaround plan for the state of New York, along with the biggest tax cut in history and making New York safe again through our anti-crime plan. And specifically on the cost of living, pe most people who don't follow state policies closely don't realize how much of the cost of food, energy, and housing is driven by bad Albany regulations. So I agree with my colleagues here on the need to expand our energy supply and an all-of-the-above energy policy, and that will help on utility bills, okay? But 48 cents of of a gallon of gas is driven by taxes from Albany. Only 16 cents has been waived for a short period of time. On food uh, and things like re uh, regulations coming out of Albany that have driven up the cost of milk and shut down well over a thousand dairy farms in the state that have had direct implications for consumers across the state. So much of this bad policy is driven by Albany. Uh, in my turnaround plan, I am focused on doing three things. We will cut 
20% of income taxes and property taxes for every person in the state. We will repeal all the regulations that drive up the cost of food, energy, and housing. Time and combined, up. Mr. Estrin, I went way over. Uh, combined, <laughs> those things will be $3,000 to $5,000 a year in the pockets of middle class families, a total game changer. And combine that with our climate plan, that's the essence of our turnaround plan for the state. Mr. Zeldin, just a 30 second rebuttal. Yeah, first, first off, uh, you know, Rolex, <clears throat> Rolex Rob again uh, was making a false claim. I never voted for the Cuomo budgets. Actually, what happened was the Senate Republicans passed our own budgets every single time I was there, self imposed spending cap, and then we reached a three way agreement. Now, what he didn't tell you about his time as Westchester executive is that the deficit went up. The debt went up, no, no. the cash reserves went down, nope. the bond rating went down, and the sewer fund owed tens of millions of dollars to the general fund. He was run out of town when he ran for re-election in 2017, just like he was run the out of town when Mr. he got Selden. crushed in Westchester the running for state Senate in 2020. I know you want to respond. I ahead. certainly do. Quick response. We cut taxes in Westchester seconds. County, and I will cut taxes in New York State. I know how to do it because I've actually done it. Go to my Twitter feed right now and see the, the proof. Lee Zeldin just told the biggest whopper ever that he didn't vote for the Cuomo budgets. Cuomo submits the budget, the executive submits it, and the legislator voted for it. So for him That's to say that happened. he didn't go with the agenda of Andrew Cuomo, who, by the way, I ran against because he was a corrupt thug back then, but you thought he was the greatest in the world, and you said I endorsed he should be president you over him. of the United States of America. I endorsed you over him. Really? You didn't do anything? Okay. All right, gentlemen, we're going to move on. Just make this stuff up as we go along, I we're guess. We're going to huh? move on. Next topic here. Mr. Zeldin, when President Trump's appointees to the Supreme Court were questioned during their confirmation hearings about Roe v. Wade, they declared it the settled law of the land. But now the court appears poised to overturn it with the votes of the Trump appointees. If you are elected governor, will you pledge to keep the New York law that affirms the right of a woman to get an abortion in this state? And if so, will you pledge to not change your mind? Uh, the law in New York goes far beyond Roe, and I believe that a lot of people who consider themselves to be pro-choice would agree with me when I say that we shouldn't allow late-term partial birth abortion in this state. I don't believe that should be legal as it is right now. I don't believe that non-doctors should be performing abortion in this state. I believe it should be legal for there to be parental consent, that there should be informed consent. Uh, I believe that we should be doing more to promote adoption. And what I found, even though I'm pro-life, is that a lot of people who consider themselves to be pro-choice agree with me. Uh, my daughters, uh, they were born in the second trimester. They were less than a pound and a half when they were born, 14 and a half weeks early. I had a chance to see life in the second trimester, and it was beautiful. Thank God they had the opportunity to survive and thrive. They're in all honors classes, getting better grades than I did when I was their age. We need to be promoting family. And I believe that right now New York's law is going too far when you start allowing late-term partial birth abortion. Mr. Giuliani. If you're elected governor, will you, same question. Yeah. So whatever differences we may have, and I think it's pretty obvious to the audience that there are quite some big differences between the candidates, we're all fathers on the stage or in the room that I'm in. And I have to tell you, uh, for me, uh, the first time that I saw my baby Grace on that ultrasound, I knew just a couple weeks after conception that the most important thing in my life was protecting her life. I'm pro-life and I'm not afraid to say it. But let me tell you one thing where I've heard the left for many years say, my body, my choice. Uh, recently, we've had health mandates come down, and this is very appropriate considering what we're dealing with tonight right here. We've had health mandates come down from two health commissioners and two governors that have said, you do not have a choice in what you can put into your body. They've said, if you don't put this into your body, then you'll lose your job to nurses and in New York City, to firefighters, to doctors, to, to uh, police officers, uh, to teachers. To me, I, I stand with them, not just in empty words, but in actions. We need to make sure that we are doing everything. And on day one, I will end these unconstitutional COVID mandates and give everybody their job back who has lost them with back pay. Mr. Wilson, same question. So I, too, am un uncomfortable with some of the excesses of current abortion policy, but I'm run not running on a social agenda. I'm running to turn around this state. That's what I'm laser focused on. I think where politicians get awry is they spend time talking about all these other issues. So I'm not, you know, I've actually, like Mr. Zeldin, I'm not comfortable with partial birth abortion. I'm not comfortable with non-doctors performing the procedure. Will you fight to change the law? I will not fight to change the law. Mr. Astorino, same question. So I think this is one of the hardest things that a woman has to go through the choice of trying to go through pregnancy and have a, a baby that they may not be prepared to have or can't afford uh, or terminate a pregnancy. So it's a really difficult choice. 
I think we've got to get back to a, a position of we're here to help. You know, prenatal care and pregnancy centers, because most of abortions are in a concentrated area of high poverty. 75% of abortions are by women who are very low income. And I think, and I've talked to many who feel that there was no other option. And there are options. And I think, again, we can have a reasonable discussion in this state. I'm pro-life. I've always been. Uh, it's who I am. And I do think we need a culture of life in this country and in our state. But lighting up the Empire State Building when they passed this law in 19 to have abortions legal up to the moment of birth, that's not where New Yorkers are. That's extreme. And so I think we should have a reasonable discussion on when it's appropriate to have restrictions. And I do agree in parental notification. Uh, and, and having doctors perform them and having clean clinics. These are things that we should have discussions about. Thank you. So the next question is going to go to you, Mr. Giuliani. You did talk about mandates just recently, but mm -hmm. you said that if elected, you're going to rehire all the state and city workers who lost their jobs because they were unvaccinated. But the truth is that governors don't have the ability to rehire city workers. And Mayor Adams has said repeatedly he's not going to do it. So how can you get these workers back on the city payroll if the mayor says absolutely not? Well, I'm very well aware of negotiations between the governor of the state of New York and the mayor. I've seen it from the other side. And I must tell you, that's when you have to use your leverage. I also know that Mayor Adams went up to Albany recently, <laughs> said he was going to get bail reform repealed, and came back uh, with his tail between his legs. Look, it's all about going up to Albany and using the leverage necessary. That's why I've said with bail reform specifically, I would sit down on day one with the, the legislature and assembly and tell you, them how it's my first priority. And then secondly, the with regards to the Mr. mayor, Giuliani, what I the would do, Marsha, I'm question. trying to answer the question over here. It's bad enough I'm in a different room because you guys have relegated me to this. Let me at least answer your question because I'm getting there on this. And frankly, I think this is a great example of the media continuing to be unfair against conservatives and acting more like Prob well, than anything else. I just want to know else. how you could do but it. But I want to answer the question here. What I would do is, if the mayor does not rehire them and I will utilize my leverage, I will put them on the state payroll because it's so important. Right now, at a time when we have a nurse shortage, we have a health care worker shortage, it's absurd to think that by this health choice, the governor decided to just fire these people arbitrarily. Look, we haven't considered natural immunity. We haven't given people this choice. The CDC director in, J in January of this year actually said on CNN that the vaccination does not prevent transmission. So what are we doing here? Is this political theater just like January 6th, Marsha? I believe it is. Mr. Giuliani, that your time is, is up. Mr. Wilson, you. your position on this. Would you, as governor... I can't governor, remember the question. Can you please go back to the question? Uh, uh, he says, Mr. Giuliani says, that if he was, if he was elected, he would uh, rehire all the people from New York City who had lost their jobs because they refused to get a vaccine. He says he can put them back on the city payroll or force the mayor to get put them back on the city, yeah, as even governor, though the mayor governor, says he as, can't do it. As governor, I'm going to focus on the things within mm -hmm. my control as governor, and I'll, I would rehire state employees, but I don't. I can go beyond the purviews of the governor's office. Mr. Astorino, well, let's start with this. Um, what has happened to children over the last two years is completely unforgivable. With schools being closed because of these unscientific mandates, I mean, I watch the science and data from around the world. And we were reacting negatively here in New York, most of us, because we were being told, you got to wear your mask, you got to be vaccinated or you can't participate in society. And by the way, um, 34,000 healthcare workers were fired. Now we have a healthcare crisis in New York. Governor Kathy Hochul made that decision and she forced the healthcare crisis. So I know as governor, I can't hire city employees back, but yes. I would demand to the mayor, as part of budget negotiations or any other negotiation, that they do hire them back with back pay and pension credits. Time is I think that's very important because people's liberties have been taken away during this whole process. Mr. Zeldin. The state should offer the people who used to work for the city a job working for the state. Uh, I, on day one, all COVID mandates end. I've been long saying that as well. Uh, what you just uh, heard from uh, Never Trumper Harry Wilson was a bit ironic because he actually implemented a company policy that would fire any of his employees who refused to get the COVID shot. 
Now, I believe that it's important for every person who has been fired to be offered their jobs back with back pay. I don't believe the religious exemption should have gotten eliminated in 2019. That should come back. We shouldn't have had two-year-olds, toddlers in masks. That was abusive and unscientific. And I don't believe anyone out there who wants to get a COVID shot should do it because the governor called on you to be her apostles. We're not looking to be ruled by an emperor or governor. She actually went into church and told New Yorkers that that's why they should get it, to be my apostles. She referred to herself as the mother of all 62 counties. We need balance and common sense restored to Albany. That means Kathy Hochul has to get fired on November 8th. Yeah, I need to respond. I need to rebut. Uh, Marsha, no, no, I need yeah. to rebut his misinformation. Just 15 so, seconds. So I need more than 15 seconds. Mr. Zeldin has never had a private sector job, so she doesn't understand how businesses work. I ran a nursing home business. President Biden was introducing a vaccine mandate for all nursing home employees, and we had to deal with that. That's where two thirds of our revenue came from was Medicare and Medicaid, and that's exactly what we did. We did it safely and fairly, and we had incredible care for our patients, 40,000 employees and 20,000 patients that we took very close care of. And because of that experience, which Mr. Zeldin clearly does not even understand, when I'm governor, I will have a full investigation of Governor Cuomo and his misdeeds in the nursing home scandal and his directive. We will prosecute him and anyone else complicit to the full extent of the law, and we will make restitution to the families who were, that were hurt by his bad policy. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Next question. You have the next question. Yes. Mr. Zeldin, you had a news conference last week saying the state should cancel congestion pricing. If you're elected, how will you pay for the much needed repairs at the MTA? Are you suggesting higher fares, new taxes, or would you just leave the MTA as it is and potentially fall into a greater state of disrepair? Yeah, and, uh, and the false charge is just I me. Mean, actually, I started and operated my own firm, but uh, putting that aside on the last one, uh, I do oppose congestion pricing. I believe that is, uh, it is unfair that people are already struggling to afford to make ends meet. And I would do everything in my power to stop congestion pricing from being implemented. Kathy Hochul, when she was with you, she stated that she supported congestion pricing and she's wrong. A decade ago, I wrote an op-ed where there was a new incoming MTA chairman where I outlined 10 different ways that we can make the MTA operate more efficiently. We still have those ways and others to make the MTA operate more efficiently, but if you want to get more revenue for the MTA, you need people to feel safe on it. If you have folks who don't feel safe on the subways and they're seeing the homeless and others with mental health issues, the crimes that are making front page headlines, you're not going to get the riders. So I think it's important that we make our subways, our streets, our businesses, our homes all as safe as possible. People are fleeing and they're not riding mass transit. And that's one of the other key ways to help pay for it. Thank you. Mr. Astorino, congestion pricing? Um, this year is going to be the revenge of the normal people. And I'll tell you why. Because congestion pricing is another backbreaker on the average New Yorker. It sounds so great, but you're going to charge $30 to go south of 60, 60th Street when New York City is trying to get back on its feet. All this does is it crushes the outer boroughs, it crushes the middle class, and the elites, they won't care at all. But more and more people will leave New York. We got to get rid of like red light cameras and speed cameras. All these are nickeling, diming people, and it's another reason to leave New York. So when I say it's going to be the revenge of the normal people, we are fed up with what the hell is going on in New York right now. And the only way to change it is to change course. And look, I did this in Westchester. I fixed our problems in Westchester County. We created jobs. We got back to normalcy. But nobody feels like they're being heard right now. And I will hear you because. Things are so bad, but they're going to get better. Help is on the way. Mr. Giuliani, congestion pricing. Well, let's be clear. Congestion pricing is a tax on hardworking New Yorkers. That's what it is. Uh, the same thing with speed and red light cameras. Look, if speed cameras existed exclusively in school zones during school hours, uh, then that's something that I'd be willing to talk about. But you see in more and more conservative areas like Staten Island, like Southern Queens, more speed cameras that pop up than honestly in some of those blue areas right there. I think this is a tax not just on hardworking New Yorkers, but I think it's a tax on conservatives here in the five boroughs and in uh, other counties around uh, New York City and around the state, frankly, as well. So I would look at it this way, though. We continue to look at New York's rising budget going from $135 billion back in 2010, now $220 billion. Let's take a look at a state that's thriving. Let's take a look at Florida at $98 billion with a million more people than we do. And I think it's pretty obvious that the same old, same old in Albany will not work. We're going to need a change agent to come in there to make Thank budget you. cuts at least 10% across the board, except 
for our law enforcement. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, congestion pricing. So I'm opposed to congestion pricing. And let me explain how my approach in general is different and how that affects the MTA specifically. So I'm not a politician. I'm a turnaround expert who spent 30 years fixing failed organizations. That applies to New York State and that applies to the MTA. Why has it failed? Because no one has taken and created a long-term plan that meets the needs of the customers, which are the people of this city and, and commuters into the city, and done it in a comprehensive and thoughtful way. What does that mean? That means a long-term capital plan. That means dealing with the cost overruns on construction and operating costs are driven by overtime, bad contracts, and excess costs, as we saw in the, uh, in the construction of the, of the Second Avenue subway. That is what we need. We need someone to actually dig deep, create a turnaround plan for the MTA, Governor Cuomo neglected it. Governor Hochul neglected it. I would fix it. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. We have a question now from our debate partner, News Radio 880, and here is Steve Burns. Right now, only the governor can recall a district attorney. Should there be a constitutional amendment to allow voters, the people, to remove a DA they don't agree with? Mr. Wilson. Yes. I, uh, I, first of all, as governor, I would use my power under Article 13 to remove any rogue district attorney who does not enforce the law, including D.A. Bragg. Um, but in terms of the focus on the question around recall, I have long been advocating initiative, referendum, and recall to empower voters much more beyond the insider control processes we have today. I have a long list of government reform plans that would make it easier to get on the ballot, that would make it easier for people to vote, uh, and make it, I'm sorry, make it easier for people to participate in the political process and, uh, and have term limits of eight years for statewide officials and 12 years for legislative leaders. Why? Because we have a broken political culture of failed career politicians on both sides of the aisle at all. Term limits on, need to, on your own job if you win. A hundred percent. But I would also, more importantly, try to uh, work hard to pass them statewide, including for the legislature. Got it. Mr. Astorino? Absolutely. I would fire Alvin Bragg and anyone who doesn't do their job, willfully ignores the law. And should there be a makes constitutional it, amendment? Uh, yeah, there should be. Absolutely. But I would use my power as governor to remove elected officials who don't do their job, like Alvin Bragg. You know, um, term limits is something I believe in. We passed it in Westchester County. I will do it in, in New York, and I think that is a way to reduce some of the corruption. But just have fresh ideas, which right now, you can't get any more stale. I mean, look, honestly, some of our own party members, the Republicans, were part of the failure here in New York. And the establishment, like Lee Zeldin, was very much a part of that. Under Dean Skelos, they kept voting with Cuomo, they kept us on this track, and they kept us in the wrong direction. Another thing for term limits, the name of the Tappan Zee Bridge is coming back. No more Cuomo. That's a term limit. <laughs> Mr. Zeldin, should there be a constitutional amendment to allow voters to remove local district attorneys? Yeah, but that should be a vote that's in Manhattan. If you're going to fire the Manhattan district attorney, it shouldn't be. But I'm for a constitutional amendment. Statewide. You can remove your local DA. I don't, I don't believe that statewide they should be voting to get rid of a county should, district attorney. Should it be a law statewide that localities Absolutely. can remove their own thousand DAs percent. that they elected? A thousand percent. But on day one, as soon as I get sworn in, the first thing I'm going to do is going to fire Manhattan district attorney Alvin Bragg. He's refusing to enforce the law. Now, what... Never Trump or Harry Wilson just didn't offer up the Republican voters out there is talking about how he donated to the campaign of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, just like he didn't tell the voters of New York that he had an a policy at his company to fire his employees who were unvaccinated, or that he was a two-time Obama advisor, or that he refused to vote for Donald Trump in 2020. He is lying to the people as if I voted lies. to defund the, the police. You did. No, right you now did. on TV, you you're lying to people at home. Budget and the 2014 you're, budget. You're just making cut, this cut up. Funding. You're it's on not, the wrong stage. Made up. You should be saying next to Jamani Williams and Tom Swazi and nonsense. Kathy Hochul. So let's talk about these hey, let's lies. Let's be mature here, okay? guys. Come on, so let's talk about the issues that are important in New York. Enough of this. <laughs> All right. In terms of Mr. Bragg, it's just thought. Um, in terms of Mr. Bragg, I've been very clear. He has been a disgrace in the office, and I would fire him day one. I have an op-ed in the New York Post saying exactly that. It is true that two years ago I gave him a donation. Now, I have given millions of dollars in political contributions over 20 years. 99.9% .9 of those are conservative Republicans. Mr. Astorino, I've given money to Mr. Zeldin, I've given money to Rudy Giuliani, not yet to Andrew, but maybe someday. <laughs> uh, so. But in, in so. that long list, there is, there is four Democrats that I've known for 30 years, and Mr. Zeldin tries to make that a capital offense. Why? Because he is distracting from his own record. It's bad judgment. He spent four thank, years thank supporting Andrew Cuomo. I'd like to answer the I've question. I've given four tiny donations to people I've known for 30 thank years. You, it is not comparable. Thank That's you, why he's failed. Bad judgment. Stay. Thank you both. Mr. Hey, guys, Giuliani, Mr. Giuliani, you, you are calling for this constitutional amendment regarding moving... Uh, yeah. district attorneys out. Can you tell us what the steps are that, that would make that happen for a constitutional yeah, well, amendment 
to I take was the place. first gubernatorial candidate, Maurice, to call for this. I called for it uh, right after his January Second. 3rd memo to Second. the district, to Third. his assistant district attorneys. I was the first one to call. You can look on the record right here. And it's actually Article 8, actually, Section Marshall 13B of the New York State <laughs> Constitution. Uh, so for me, uh, when I look at this, I think it's so, very clear. So, Mr. Giuliani, when what's the process? How does that work? We know you stand for it, but how does it work? How would it work? Yeah, well, the, the governor on day one can invoke Article 8, Section 13B of the New York State Constitution. Anybody no, that's can not look what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the way the right voters there. would get the opportunity to have this constitutional amendment uh, changed for them to be able to remove their local DA. How does that work? Yeah, well, I said very clearly on this that I think this is something that should be a ballot amendment that we should have on there so that way localities how do you, can vote for recount how do you get like the we're talking about San Francisco how over here as we how saw do you, this. In as here. governor, how, do, how would you get an amendment on the ballot? What's the how process? How would we get an amendment on the ballot? What's we would the actually, We would go through the legislative process on this what with is the, the assembly legislative and process? the state senate. And it would take ultimately two different sessions to actually get this through. So that's how it actually works in Albany to get this done over here. I understand what you're trying to do, but if you let me actually answer the question rather than try to trap me into this, if this is an assent, this is a actual assembly and state senate process, but I would push for this as governor. But what I would do as we don't have recall actually on the New York State Constitution right there, right now is I would remove him on day one and I would invoke like I said article 8 section 13 B of the New York State Constitution when I think about our war on police and everything that they have gone through over the last couple of years it breaks my heart as a New Yorker that has a young daughter I don't want New Yorkers to continue to think about having to move to other places okay. to be safe we have the game plan to actually make New York the safest state in the country again it wasn't that far for long ago Marcia you remember when New New York was such a safe place, but look, this is obviously a legislative thing, but I will use my power as governor to make sure we can Thank do you. everything we possibly can Thank you, Mr. to utilize the legislature and push them. As we our move forward, question our question, question, go ahead. I was going to say that we're going to move forward with domestic terrorism, and from now on, all question and answers will be 30 seconds because we're running out of time. <laughs> this first question is going to you, Mr. Astorino. Domestic terrorism is a huge problem in this country and hitting close to home with the Buffalo shootings. What are your ideas to protect New Yorkers from domestic terrorism and should there be limits to what can be posted on social media? 30 seconds. Domestic terrorism is also the bombing of a pro-life center in Amherst, New York. And that person needs to be charged as a domestic terrorist as well. We need to get very tough on criminals. That always is the case, but it's not happening in New York. Charges are being dropped. We're coddling criminals. We're turning the other way. We're saying, do what you want to do. Don't worry about it here in New York. We've got to get tough on criminals, and I will. I had Should to run a police department in Westchester County. What's that? Should there be limits on social media postings? I think we've got to be really careful when we start putting limits on the First Amendment and who's going to define hate speech. That's not something, that's not a rat hole I think we should be going down. Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I too uh, worry about uh, constraints in the First Amendment. I think the focus should be on people we know are a problem, criminals, the mentally ill who have violent tendencies, and people who are purveyors of hate. Those are the three primary drivers of the problems, including the, the, the tragedy in Buffalo. And that's what we're doing a terrible job on because we have ineffective politicians running our state. So that's where I would focus, and that's what we need to focus on. Mr. Giuliani. Oh, when I look at this, you know, every single question that seems to be the answer for the left on this is go after our Second Amendment rights and our First Amendment rights. If we want to actually look at the answer on this, then why don't we repeal Section 230? Because then you're not going to have actually a leftist organization like a Twitter have a think tank that's going to come in and actually take a look at speech. You're going to have the general counsels do that. And then when you do that, you end up taking the conservative or liberal out of this stuff. Look, the answer is more speech, not less speech, Marsha. And the fact that government Governor Hochul's first instinct is to go after our second and first amendment is really scary for law-abiding New Yorkers. Mr. Zeldin. You can't infringe on the first amendment. You have to protect first amendment rights and you can't infringe upon that. That has to be the gold standard. Uh, and when you talk domestic terrorism, right now you just had somebody go to Justice Kavanaugh's house uh, targeting him and his family. And whether it's the attacks in Portland targeting a courthouse or taking over city streets in Seattle. Uh, or the, the riots that we saw right here in New York City. All across our entire country, we've seen domestic terrorism. And if we want to be honest about this conversation, we have to tackle all of this, not just what's convenient for the narrative. Okay, Mr. Zeldin, thank you. This question is for you as well. Some school districts have incorporated Asian American history into their school curriculum. Since this, <clears throat> since this is Pride Month, and in the interest of being more inclusive, should New York school districts incorporate LGBTQ history into their curriculums? 
Uh, well, I, I, first off, I don't think that, uh, that material that's in class that's not age appropriate is ever right. Uh, of all kinds, of all sor sorts. I remember having a, a health class in the 11th grade. Uh, there's material being taught to our kids earlier right now that is not age appropriate, and I do not support that. Uh, I do believe that the material inside the classroom shouldn't be divisive, whether it's critical race theory or whatever else you want to call it. We have kids who are getting along just fine until that agenda comes into the classroom. I do not believe that the classrooms in New York State should be used to advance an agenda uh, that is not age appropriate. Let parents deal with this at home. Parents have a fundamental right to control the upbringing of their child, and they don't relinquish that right by sending their kids off to school. Same question, Mr. Giuliani. When I think about this, I look at a bill that a gentleman who was in New York just yesterday actually passed in Florida called the Parental Rights and Education Bill. Look, the truth is, as the father of a young daughter, I'm concerned with how we've brought sexualization into the classroom at such a young age. I, too, believe that it's so important that parents take the lead in education, and that includes sex education. I remember when this used to be called health, and to me, I think it's so important that we get back to that. Look. We lost a certain level of morality in our state. And as governor, I would do everything I possibly could to make sure that parents, yes, parents, are the primary stakeholders in our kids' education. Thank you. Mr. Astorino, same question. Well, I remember a health class, yeah, we would watch the film, and everyone would giggle a little bit, and that was it. <laughs> but our parents talked to us. Now, you know, if somebody drives up to a playground with a white van, and tries to pull kids over and talk sex to them, they'd be arrested. However, now we're being taught that in our schools, our five-year-olds. How are we having a debate in this country whether sex should be taught to five-year-olds? It is completely inappropriate. So too is critical race theory, where they are dividing people by class, by color. This stuff has to be tamed and stopped, and I will, because it's totally unacceptable here in New York. Same question, Mr. Wilson. So, Maurice, uh, education is one of the most important issues. It's the great equalizer. It's how I was able to go from being a working class kid, immigrant family in Johnstown to Harvard, and then on to great business success. So it's a hugely important issue, but respectfully, the issues you're focused on are not the most important issues. The most important issues are, I would say, twofold. We need to reinvigorate civics education. We need to make sure our kids are being taught that they live in the greatest country in the face of the earth, and that socialism failed, and that because we've neglected the basics, our kids are not learning what they need to learn to be good citizens. The second piece is we need a curricular reboot. We had an entire generation of kids destroyed by two years of COVID and remote learning. And we need to reboot them and get them on a path over the next three to five years to catch up for all the learning loss that took place because of bad policies over the last two years. Okay. Thank you all. Our final segment here is called In One Word, and we're going to ask you questions. Please give us one word answers. I know you can do it. We're going to start here with Mr. Giuliani. Name a secret skill or talent. Definitely not karaoke. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it blank. Mr. Zeldin. <laughs> uh, people don't know I'm a black belt. I actually once won the world championships in sparring. Not something that I've ever mentioned publicly before. That's a first. Mr. Wilson? Blackjack. Mr. Astorino. Yo seré el gobernador para todos los New Yorkinos. I speak Spanish. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Zeldin, what do you think people notice most about you? Integrity. Uh, I'm in my 20th year right now. One in the word. United States One Army. word. One word. Uh, integrity. Honor, integrity. Mr. Wilson. My family, my wife, and four daughters. Mr. Astorino. Honesty. Mr. Giuliani. Passion. Mr. Wilson, yoga or spin? <laughs> uh, weightlifting, but if I had to pick between those two, I'd say spin. Mr. Zeldin. Honestly, I've never done spin, and I did yoga once, and I decided never to do that one again. What's your workout of choice? Uh, I, I like to do push-ups, sit-ups, run. Um, I like to hit weights when they're available. All right, Mr. Giuliani, Eating yoga, yoga or spin? Pizza. That's been my workout on the campaign trail. No yoga, no spin. <laughs> Definitely Mr. a little spin. A little spin, maybe. Okay, Mr. Astorino. <laughs> Don't make me pick yoga or spin. Basketball. <laughs> okay. okay, Mr. Astorino, what's your favorite smell? Smell? Smell. 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 My wife's hair. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Giuliani, your favorite smell? Well, it's definitely not the homeless that have come on the street of New yeah. York. Um, you know what? I think it's that fresh dew in the morning when you walk outside. Mr. Zeldin, your favorite smell? Victory, November 8th. <laughs> Mr. Wilson. My wife's perfume. Mr. Giuliani, beverage of choice? Uh, it's Coke Zero. Mr. Zeldin. 
I, uh, I find myself drinking a lot of Gatorade during the day. <laughs> Mr. Wilson. Coffee. Mr. Astorino. I like a nice IPA beer. So, Mr. Zeldin, where is your thinking place? At home with my wife. Mr. Wilson? My office. Mr. Astorino? At home. Mr. Giuliani, your thinking place? It's been the campaign car the last year. Do you have any crypto investments, Mr. Wilson? Uh, my daughter does, but I do not. Mr. Zeldin? I don't. Mr. Giuliani, crypto investments? I do, but I wish it was more. <laughs> Mr. Astorino? Not yet, but I will, and I hope they come into New York. They should. So, Mr. Astorino, do you use TikTok? And if not, what is your social media of choice? Oh, I love TikTok. Please go to at Rob Astorino, because I like to have a lot of fun on TikTok. Mr. Wilson. No to TikTok, uh, Facebook. So, uh, Mr. Zeldin? No, as a member of, of Congress, because of the CCP and the, the CFIUS investigation, I've stayed off of TikTok. But on other social media, at Lee Zeldin. Mr. Giuliani. Truth, so Truth Social, at Andrew H. Giuliani. Where'd you meet your spouse, Mr. Wilson? College. Mr. Zeldin. Washington, D.C., uh, right after a, w a military wedding. And uh, I asked her for a phone number. She gave me her email address. <laughs> Apparently, she did want to stay in touch. Mr. Giuliani. People won't believe it, but Yankee Stadium at Derek Jeter's last home game. <laughs> OK. And Mr. Astorino, where'd you meet your spouse? Pete's Saloon in Elmsford. She was my waitress. I tipped her well, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Astorino, when was the last time you wore a costume? And what did you dress as? Poof, costume. Batman when I was little for Halloween. Can't think of one recently. <laughs> Mr. Wilson? Halloween and Clark Kent with the shirt open for Superman. Mr. Zeldin? I had reserve duty last month, so I was in that suit, which I like wearing a lot more than this one. And Mr. Giuliani, last time you wore a costume? I think the last Halloween costume I was a Notre Dame quarterback. Gentlemen, thank you. We, thank you. <laughs> we want to thank you for being good sports right there. And we want to thank you for a spirited debate. We appreciate it. Our coverage of tonight's debate doesn't end right here. I want you to tune into our streaming service tonight, CBS News New York, right now, where CBS 2's Dick Brennan will analyze the debate with a panel of experts. And a reminder, early voting for the primary runs from June 18th through the 28th. Election day is Tuesday, June 28th. The polls open at 6 a.m.